Organizations' internal networks are overly permissive and can't distinguish trusted from untrusted applications. Attackers abuse this condition to move laterally through networks, bypassing address-based controls to spread malware. Edgewise abstracts security policies away from traditional network controls that rely on IP addresses, ports, and protocols, and instead ties controls directly to applications. Edgewise allows organizations to analyze the network attack surface and segment workloads based on the software and how it's communicating. Edgewise monitors applications and protects data paths using zero trust segmentation. Visit edgewise.net forward slash security weekly to get your free month of visibility. Some restrictions apply. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then Gravwell is the solution for you. Gravwell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. Gravwell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Endgame's converged endpoint security platform is transforming security programs. Their people, processes, and technology with the most powerful endpoint protection and simplest user experience, ensuring analysts of any skill level can stop targeted attacks before information theft. Endgame unifies prevention, detection, and threat hunt to stop known and unknown attacker behaviors at scale with a single agent. For more information, visit endgame.com. Well, welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. I even have a, a keyboard that like does stuff so I can read uh, an announcement. How about that? Because that's what we're going to do. Some of you told us that you're overwhelmed by the amount of content that we distribute in an attempt to make things a little easier. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to a special mailing list that will ultimately uh, enroll you in a program that sends you notifications about content we publish if it's in your interests. So make sure you do that. Securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Also forward slash guests allows you to suggest guests for the show and stuff you want to see us put in in the blender i suppose <laughs> Corey thune is here with us he's the ceo and co-founder of gravel did i pronounce your last name correctly every time i said it, i feel like i'm pronouncing it wrong Corey. well every every time you say it it's slightly different uh so <laughs> they're they're pretty close though i got gotcha. you that's good wait every time you say it it's slightly different or every time i say it it's or both no every time you say it it's oh slightly different. okay i'm just you know i'm keeping you on your toes keeping yeah things, it's good it's good keeping things interesting uh, so, uh, Corey, wh what is Gravwell? Remind our audience uh, what you guys do at Gravwell and set the stage for uh, this segment. Yeah, sure. So uh, we do um, data analytics, uh, like the uh, you know the roles showed earlier. Uh, the idea is uh, we can take in data from any kind of data source and play with it without having to know what it was beforehand. Uh, or anything about that, and that uh, sort of plays into what we're going to be talking about today, since uh, this new um, data source is, is new as of Tuesday. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of time to uh, to build up complicated indexes or anything like that on some of the stuff. Um, so that's awesome. That's what we do. So you, you take on structured data, perhaps, and make sense of it. Yeah, we use, uh, use a query syntax to, uh, to do some hunting amongst the data, ask a lot of questions, um, do statistical analysis, ML, stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, you build your dashboards and your reports and your uh, C-suite type stuff on top of it. Um, but uh, helping to make sense of the data, similar to like a Splunk or an Elk or uh, along that vein. Um, but we we really focus on that unstructured first, uh, ingest first, ask questions later mm -hmm. aspect to things. And the data fusion part is really important. And if we have time, we'll get into a little bit of that today. You know, I, I wrote this crappy Python script once that took in unstructured data and uh, I, I was really frustrated, so I give you a, a whole lot of credit for doing what you do, Peter. I sh I'm sure you guys do some of that uh, similar kind of operations as well. Last week, we also talked about uh, Equal, which is Endgame's... Uh, have you seen that, Corey? Uh, Endgame's release to kind of uh, basically ingest data and then allow you to do simple queries against it. Uh, no, I didn't, actually. Just check, check that out. out. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's in your, in your wheelhouse, so... Uh, so... <clears throat> the announcement this week, Corey, was speaking of getting more more data, right? Yep. If you don't have Gravel, you're probably like, oh my God, more data. If you do have Gravel, 
Uh, you're like, more data's great. We're awesome. It's at nice of you to really set. Uh, you're just <coughs> softballing these over at me. You, you like that, I really huh? appreciate it. <laughs> the hard questions are going to come towards the end of the segment. When oh, okay, I'm gotcha. Almost done with my scotch. Uh, or bourbon, <laughs> rather. So um, <clears throat> what happened was that DNS logging is now incorporated into Sysmon. Yes. What does that mean? Ex- is... What does that mean exactly? Is that like what, all the queries and responses and like what kind of format? Like how does that work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for uh, for people who don't know, um, and I have some visual aids if you'd like to throw those up as well. But uh, Sysmon is a utility uh, put out by Microsoft. Mark, Mark uh, Rasinovich is, if I pronounce that correctly, yes, uh, is the is the guy's name behind uh, behind those tools. So it's part of the uh, the Sys internal suite. Which, if you haven't played with those and you are responsible for IT of Windows systems, that's definitely something that you need to get in and check out. Um, but the big thing that came out this week is they added uh, two major things. They added DNS logging, which is really huge uh, because uh, historically that's been pretty difficult. Um, and then they added the original file name. So on process create, they added another field that gives you a little bit more data. Uh, of importance about where these processes are coming from and, and what's going on. I got you. Uh, so in the base uh, of the new release, do I know which process made that DNS request based on my Sysmon logs? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's we'll, awesome. We'll get into and show uh, some some what the actual event looks like. We'll, yep. we'll really you know, get into the weeds here in a minute. That, that's, that's something, because exactly listening to you in the beginning, I was like, well, I mean, I can turn logging on on my DNS servers. I can get query logs. That's cool. Uh, I can turn it on on the network if I get a bro sensor. It tells me all about what DNS queries are happening on my network. But the piece of data that I don't get unless I want to try and do some correlation is which process on that system made that request. That's an important piece of data. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And uh, there is a caveat to keep in mind because this is coming off of the endpoint. So if it's an attacker-controlled endpoint, then potentially you've got... uh, uh, the ability to prevent this data from going out, uh, but you've at least got it up to that point, yeah. right? If, assuming that you're centralizing <clears throat> or sending, you know, the event logs out of the endpoints. Um, but the, yeah, yeah, Corey, it was uh, Carlos Perez that talked about a couple of different techniques to uh, bypass, get around, or manipulate Sysmon data so that it's not logging what the attacker is doing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm not sure yeah. so, where Microsoft is in, you know, kind of that cat and mouse game, right? Because basically... I think what you were getting, right? Anything that happens on the endpoint, if an attacker controls the endpoint, that means they can influence and or control anything that happens on the endpoint, so all bets are off. Yeah, one, once they're there. Uh, so it's still important to do your network-based uh, or, or service-based logging. So if you've got DNS servers, you, know, you want to be logging those. You want to be doing using your bro or something to pull mm-hmm. um, DNS out of there. But uh, But yeah, from the endpoint now, we've got a real easy way to see which uh, process was making those requests. That's awesome. So you, do you have a, a demo or materials? Yeah, let's just jump right into it. So um, let me um, let You're me gonna... try this and see if sharing the screen is going to work with <clears throat> Skype. I'm on Linux, so um, screen sharing and, and these types of things. Is I knew I liked you for a reason, Corey. That's just one. It's just one reason why I like you. Just one of them. Uh, all right, so we got we we good on uh, on this. Uh, I can see it. Yes. Here. Looks like yeah. Good. All right. My God, all that crazy Linux talk. Yeah, we're good. Mm. All right. Cool. Uh, okay. So yeah. So so I just put together a brief slide deck. This is mostly for me because I have trouble following a, a you know an outline of what we actually want to talk about if I don't have some some type of sure uh, thing going on. So yeah. So Sysmon. Uh, uh, we already <laughs> kind of talked about what it was. Uh, the link is there. Uh, if you search Sysmon, it's the it's the first thing. Um, but this, their their advertisement or, or their description of it is, yeah, get, getting additional events out of Windows, because I don't know if you guys have ever plugged into the you know Windows Event Viewer, but there's a lot of a lot of stuff in there, uh, and and Sysmon is great because it gives you some of the stuff that you care about, uh, which well, is which is a does little it give different. you stuff that isn't normally logged by Windows events? Yes, uh, or at least not normally logged easily. Yeah, if okay, that makes sense. gotcha. There's yeah, often yeah, yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, you have. You have it might be like actually three events to record a single type of thing happening, uh, and there's different types of logon events are a good example. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so Sysmon gives you sort of a more concise and a and a uh, additional events that you wouldn't get otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's great for that. 
Um, and it's free, as in beer, uh, which is definitely uh, an awesome thing. So for uh, you know enterprises or, or SMBs that are um, uh, you know, you've got budget uh, that you got to worry about and all these things. Sysmon gives you, it's sort of that Pareto principle. I like saying the 80, 20, 20% of your tools get you 80% of the way there. This is one of them. Mm -hmm. Sysmon uh, really gets you a tons of stuff. Uh, so if you don't have some enterprise endpoint thing, then Sysmon is, is fantastic. And the installation uh, is super easy. It's, it's, uh, it's a command line. If you're going to do it on a, on an endpoint or, you know, use group policy or something to push it out and then run it. And then it's up and running right away. And it's creating events in the Windows Event Viewer uh, for you to play with, and and it's super lightweight as well. It's not doing signature stuff. It's not doing uh, a bunch of the things that can often bog down, like an antivirus or or whatever. So it's it's just grabbing the events and recording them for you to uh, for you to look at stuff later. So uh, that's a big thing for like uh, ICS. Uh, a lot of times they're wary about running agents on the endpoint systems, right? You don't, you, you don't want to take down your HMI because you were worried about viruses. Um, but Sysmon is a, is a great thing to put there for monitoring in those types of environments because of how, how lightweight and, and relatively, I mean, it's been around for a while, so it's pretty, it's pretty stable. Um, so yeah, the, I, the other reason that I have slides is because I'm on a Linux computer, so I don't have the Windows Event Viewer that mm -hmm. I can just you know poke in. So I took some screenshots. Um, so this is an example of like the security, uh, quote unquote, Windows logs. Uh, and if you've played in the event viewer and tried to filter down with what stuff is important and what's going on, like you can see I've got the filter box open here. I'm trying to remove events that don't matter, like these audit successes and stuff. And it it's painful. Uh, to, if, if you were trying to do this on an individual endpoint or, or even across multiple endpoints, but trying to dig through this stuff, it's... It's not fun. Um, and so that's something that Sysmon really helps out with because it really, it, if you did, if you didn't have to worry about any of this stuff and you just focused on Sysmon, it wouldn't even be a, in a bad position, right? If you're going to focus on one type of Windows event, just using Sysmon, it isn't terrible. Uh, so what does an event look like? So let's just fire up PowerShell. We'll run calc.exe, right? And we'll see what, uh, what shows up in Sysmon when we do that. <clears throat> And uh, in the event that's created, I'll zoom in on it in just a second here, uh, shows up as a process create event. Uh, so this is a Sysmon rule that, uh, that will log all process creations. And uh, these are some of the details. And so it's got like the command line, it's got the parent image uh, down at the bottom there. You can see that it ran from PowerShell, the parent command line, the user that ran it, the system that it ran on. It's got a GUID for, the process, like lots of good stuff in here for if you're going to be doing threat hunting uh, or, you know, even just user behavior analytics uh, or that kind of a thing. Uh, this is some good information about all processes that are being created on your systems. And uh, so Sysmon allows you to get this stuff in a, in a, you know, this is a single event. So that part's really nice. Uh, and it includes some configuration things. So you can create like an XML file of some configuration stuff that you want to do for Sysmon to, uh, to be able to um, set up some filters and some things like that. Because if you don't filter anything, uh, obviously if you're logging every single process that every one of your endpoints ever creates, that could potentially be more data than you can handle or you know, your analysts are comfortable uh, digging through. And so there's opportunity to do that, which is now where Taylor Swift enters the picture. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, those configuration stuff for Sysmon. Um, so uh, if you guys are, uh, you guys are familiar with the uh, Swift on Security uh, Twitter account, right? Yes. Uh, great source of entertainment, yep. great source of knowledge and, uh, and stuff in this space. Um, uh, so the, the configuration file, actually, these are a couple of example events. So we'll touch on these first. Um, like here's an example of the uh, process create event that we just showed uh, earlier. Um, but yeah, actually we'll get into DNS in just a minute. So let's talk about the Swift on security uh, XML file. So this is available uh, publicly on GitHub um, and, and put up here uh, through the Swift on security account. Um, lots of great configuration options within here. And installing this configuration file is just something that you give Sysmon EXE 
uh, at your runtime. Uh, you'll point it at a, a configuration file, and that will automatically configure it. It'll set up and, and read the file and do all the filtering and, and everything like that. So um, it's a really great baseline. And if we dig into, I think it would be a great idea to just kind of poke through this file a little bit to see some of the stuff that it does. Um, and I guess as a caveat to this, uh, we're sort of assuming a little bit that there's some, like the Sysmon aspect to this is gonna go a little bit fast. Uh, so, so if you are unfamiliar with this entirely, um, there's some good resources to go through and dig through it, uh, or you know, ask questions in, in chat or forums or email or whatever beyond. Um, but yeah, so the, so the Sysmon configuration file, uh, Taylor Swift, um, has done a really great job commenting this out so that you can tailor this to your individual organization as well. Uh, so, so for any one of these rules, there's usually some comments about why they're there. Uh, one of the updates that just happened uh, on this was adding in some MITRE ATT&CK reference points uh, for some of the things so you can have an easier job mapping these rules to, uh, to the framework if that's your jam for, uh, for, uh, for what you're doing on the security side. Uh, but as you can see, like it, so if so, we look at the process create event, and then we're going to do an on match exclude, and so we can come in and get rid of a bunch of noise that would sort of otherwise uh, be overwhelming to the process creation uh, logging events, especially when you're uh, if you don't have some really awesome tools like Grabwell to dig through it, um, and you're trying to do this a little bit more manually. Uh, then that could be trouble. So getting some good filtering in here uh, is a good idea. But obviously, when you're doing filtering like this, um, if an attacker has control of the system in some way that they can change their payload to mimic one of these executables, then you're game over uh, anyway, right? It's a downside to whitelisting or filtering off of those types of things. So that's an important caveat to keep in mind as well. But um, But you can see... Uh, we're filtering on some images and things, and there's a few different event IDs that Sysmon puts out. So let's look at those for just a second. Uh, if I go to the Sysmon page, uh, we can uh, we can look and see that there's um, uh, they describe the events here. There's process creation, uh, process change to file creation time. So if somebody's you know stomping all over file timestamps, uh, that that generates an event in Sysmon. Network connections generate events. Uh, process is being terminated, drivers loaded, image loaded, create remote threads, file creates, registry events, uh, all this great stuff for things that are happening on. Oh, wait, so <clears throat> should the Taylor Swift song stop playing in my head now that we're not on the <laughs> Swift Dude, by security game? Yeah, yeah, it's been bitch. happening to me too. Uh, ever so since I started said that, putting I like, these things together, it's in feet. my head. I can't stop. Mm -hmm. I, just, I can't get out of my head For me, it's like now. the goat screaming version. Because mm. I, I looked at the, I don't know if you've seen that one. No, I the, haven't. Uh, yeah, it's a mock, uh, <laughs> it's a mock, focus. Uh, a spoof focus. on it. Focus, focus, focus. focus. All right. Event Stay on target. Is what we're focusing on. Stay on target. Guys. <laughs> Luke, you've switched Event off your targeting computer. That's the DNS event. <laughs> this is the one that's the big deal this week. This is the one that everybody's all excited about. This is why Sysmon is so hot right now is because we want to know about this event ID 22 and what kind of stuff is in that event. And so if we go, uh, so I got some, uh, some of the actual event uh, out of the XML. This is what uh, uh, Windows generates as part of the event. Uh, and so let's, take, let's just take a look at what's in there. So we see um, this is some standard, the, the system uh, properties are the standard things that go with uh, all these events. We have uh, time created, the computer that it came from. Um, and I got to admit, like, I'm trading off a little bit of OPSEC for cool points for having Ninja Turtle naming scheme on my home network here because all this was so fast to put this stuff together for, you know, for the segment here today that I, I didn't really spin up a test network or anything. So these are, these are the Windows machines that we've got around here. Uh, and I use Ninja Turtles for my home naming scheme. So you must not have a but, lot of systems on your network? Just like I don't have very many Windows like systems. For Michelangelo, sure. Leonardo, Donatello. Yeah, see, so, so you can math. Raphael, 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 Raphael you, yes. And my printer's name is April, of course, because <clears throat> she's the news. Anyway, yeah. Fo yeah. guys, focus. <coughs> focus. Stay on target. <laughs> Talking about event 22. 
pass that out That's tonight. Got... But wait, That's what's the guy's prime... name in the hockey mask? <laughs> it's got our process squid. And it's got our uh, query name, right? So in this case, uh, basically the Windows machines in my house are gaming computers, and that's pretty much all I use them for. So this is Battle.net uh, reaching out to uh, to do some stuff. So we see the query name is Battle.net. Uh, we see the query status, which indicates a success. And then we see the query results here, where we've got the, uh, the address uh, or addresses of our results. But then, yeah, as you were talking about earlier, Paul, the image is the big cheese here. This shows us the process that made this request. And in this case, we're looking at the battle.net.exe process that comes from uh, you know from Blizzard for for this type of stuff. Uh, so so this is the big this is the cool part. This is the mapping of the process that requested it, what the response was, and you know the computer that it came from our support our, yeah, our, I guess the, the four awesome. big things. It, it's interesting the Sands uh, Internet Storm Center just had a post where they were tracing back, uh, doing forensics, and it was part of gaming software as well. I think that falls in the similar category of utilities that you might install for your hardware, like your motherboard, mm -hmm. that often, mm -hmm. like, I just feel like those are two classes of software that, like, do weird things that when we do investigations, we're like, that's not, no, it's not. It's, yep. it's just yep. a motherboard yep. utility or it's a ga uh, gaming utility, right? Yeah, you'll see that later. I actually have uh, a Razer mouse and keyboard mm. and have a little utility that backs up to the cloud. But of course, where's their servers located? China. Uh, yeah, so so we'll see that uh, maybe later as we as we poke into stuff. Um, but so this is the base event. This is what uh, this is the data that's included in there. Right. So if we go back to the, uh, the Taylor Swift configuration, um, there's lots of really good stuff in here. I highly recommend that people install this. Uh, but if we go down to the DNS side, uh, so that's here. Uh, so here's our DNS query event. Uh, and we're going to onmatch exclude. And uh, there's lots of network noise type stuff that um, the individual responsible for this uh, tried to exclude. Uh, in my case, uh, I kept in this stuff about Microsoft uh, because I don't want to see that um, and I don't care. But, uh, but everything else I actually deleted. So as we go through and we're looking at real data later, I took out all this stuff because I wanted to see every DNS query from this endpoint and what was making it mm -hmm. uh, out of curiosity, right? I'll probably maybe put this stuff in as I fine tune or some things, or maybe I'll just filter it. Uh, the reality is I don't have that much data here, so I'm just going to filter it in Grabwell instead mm -hmm. uh, because my general Grabwell configuration is I just I want everything in there. So that way, if I ever need to do some root cause, I have the data in its mm -hmm. wrong format and I can dig through it. But if you don't, uh, you can filter this stuff here, and then you're going to get less uh, less noise and less garbage. Uh, that is, in general, not a problem, right? Like if 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 things are reaching out to Azure, you're not you're not worried about that. Unless you're uh, commanding it's... control servers in Azure, but you know. well, that's true. That's true. Uh, <clears throat> and you know what? I actually don't know if like this portal .azure .com will mm -hmm. match subdomains. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I think that's what this that that must be what this rule is, right? This must be so. If query name condition is, uh, then that matches the complete uh, domain. But if query name condition ends with, that's looking for the, you know, the end. Uh, so this will grab subdomains. Gotcha. Whereas the is will not. So this is only going to get portal.azure.com. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, but I, that I will also not to speak for the the person responsible, but Swift on security. You know, gave a caveat. This is a work in progress. It's um, uh, they had a slight uh, preview on the uh, the new Sysmon update, so it's not like this was put together in a day. This has been a couple weeks running, uh, but it's a work in progress mm -hmm. as well. So, um, so there's that. Uh, so anyway, so this configuration, you put this in with Sysmon, and you're going to get some real great events, and you're going to cut out a little bit of noise, and so you can focus on the kinds of stuff that is uh, is stuff that you that you care about, uh, that's that's really interesting. And uh, and so then the rest of this is let's just, let's dig in and let's look and see what the data actually looks like uh, and and play with it using the um, the, the Grabwall interface here. Uh, so uh, also as a caveat, um, this is, you know, live data, let's uh, sacrifice to the demo gods and all that business, but uh, I think we should be fine. Well, you know, the, um, the, the players are going to play, 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 and the, the haters <laughs> are going to hate, 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 hate. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, if the demo breaks, yeah, whatever. 
uh, we're just playing live. So, but I think it it also uh, should serve to uh, sort of highlight the the benefit of uh, rapid data exploration, right? Like this, we didn't know what 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 properties were in this file or anything beforehand. I didn't have to configure any indexing; it just worked uh, for for how this was going to work. Um, and so, yeah, I put together all the stuff in you know a couple hours. Yeah, um, just but shake um, it off and let's go. So if we so if we do this, so so I'm I also as another caveat. I'm going to be exploring and using Gravwell as if I was a community user, which is our our free version uh, for up to two gigs a day. Uh, but uh, secret, if you uh, you know see the show and email me, we can up that for you. Um, but the so we're coming in as a community user, so some of the bells and whistles for the paying customers aren't here for some of this pre-built stuff. So we're going to be coming at everything, I guess, sort of sort of raw for for how things are looking. So with Gravwell Community Edition. Uh, you, you get you get dropped in, and we get the data in. Um, I'm I'm going to gloss over that part, but actually, I should say uh, the way that we're getting this data in is our Windows uh, Events ingester, which if you go to gravel.com or or, or uh, docs.gravel.io, uh, you can download this Windows ingester. It's a very very small agent that sits on your endpoint, and all it does is watch the Windows events, the same as your event viewer, and forward those out. And super, and that's super, and that's also that's also free. Yes, that's okay. that's free. Gotcha. Uh, so all of our all of our ingestors are free, and in additional, uh, GitHub.com slash Gravel, they are open source. Um, so our, our ingestors are open source, and our ingest Fantastic. library is open source. In case we have an ingester that you don't, that, or, or we don't have an ingester that you want, you can build it uh, using our using our library. So and they're, they're because, all built in Go. Is that what you're saying, Peter? Yep. Yep. Uh, no, all I, of our yeah, our platform is all Go. Uh, and which is do you support S3 buckets? Uh, for running stuff, yeah, yeah. And we've done like Kinesis. Uh, there's a Kinesis ingester right here. Oh, my God. I'm um, going to that... use this when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. But you got to wait till the end because it might blow up. So we'll see. Um, <laughs> it, it'll either I mean, blow up or blow up mine. Perfect software uh, with no bugs at all. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, Win the Windows events ingester is... Uh, yeah, so this is just a really tiny shim. Honestly, it does it does nothing. It's like the Splunk Universal Forwarder stands up like four different processes when it starts running. This is a single process, and all it does is watch the stuff and forward it out. So you don't have to worry about things. You can and you can fi configure whether or not it's going to cache if it doesn't have connectivity, uh, which is the only thing you need to worry about because if it doesn't have connectivity and you have cache on, then it'll use disk. Otherwise, is that, super simple, super safe. And I think we were talking about this earlier, Corey. Does uh, Sysmon work the same way in terms of caching? Could you cache the Sysmon? Because I'm the scenario I'm thinking of is you've got users that take their laptop and they go elsewhere. Maybe they come back mm -hmm. and they connect to the domain. Do I then get those logs yep. when they were off the network? Yep. So, uh, so the Windows Event Viewer will keep those events. Uh, and so, if you uh, if you don't have something like Gravwell, you can go back in time for as long as the wind as Windows keeps those around. Mm -hmm. But if you do have the Windows and Jester on there, it'll read them and cache them in our format, uh, and then ship it out as soon as it can reach. Sweet. Uh, again, uh, and all that's encrypted and authenticated and all that business as well. So it's not going to randomly send them to some system that listens on a port or something like that. Gotcha. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's how we get data in. There's a blog post uh, that we have that sort of goes over. Uh, Sysmon and getting data in, so we're going to skip over that and just uh, get to the part where we're looking at the data. So um, if you've used something like the Linux command line or Splunk before, you've probably seen a query syntax that's very similar to what we're doing. We're, we're going to be building up a pipeline of modules that are each module does one thing and does it well, and then you pipe them together to come up with your final analysis or your result about the kinds of stuff that you want to do. And so if I don't give it any modules and I just say tag equals sysmon, then I'm going to get back all the raw data from sysmon. And so I show this only because to illustrate again, like the raw data is there. So any visualization we make from here on out always has that raw data under it so that if our parsing module or something like that uh, had a bug or, or couldn't see uh, some data or the attacker had cleverly hidden it in some other way, you can always get to that raw data. It's not normalized. Uh, and that's a really important aspect to uh, what we're doing here, what we're talking about. Uh, so as we saw uh, on the, the Sysmon page, the event ID for the DNS is 22. And so, uh, so I'm going to invoke what we call a, a parsing module. Uh, and so this is our WinLog module. 
which will extract uh, events from the Windows XML. So sort of a shortcut -y, um, uh, you know, helper tool for analyzing that. Because we also have an XML module and you could do all this by hand in that, but we have a WinLog module to make it a little bit easier. So we're gonna extract the event ID and we're gonna match it against 22. So that way we see only events 22 and we can see their general frequency in here. If I see a spike or something that I'm interested in, uh, at any point in time, we can zoom in on that and see the results uh, and then um, go back. And that doesn't relaunch the search. Uh, that uses our, our our awesome second order searching within the stuff without having to do that. And, um, and but Corey, a, a kind of inside baseball question. Um, your your back end and your uh, plugins right are written in Go. What's the front end written in, just out of curiosity? Oh, uh, yeah, front end. No, no problem. Front end is uh, Angular. Uh, it's an Angular single page web app. Okay. Um, so you're getting a bunch of stuff. Our charting library is uh, eCharts, but uh, mostly Angular and some stuff like that. Sweet. Um, yeah, I don't mind saying. Um, awesome. So, uh, which also enables some kind of cool things uh, where you can do like. Uh, uh, some custom visualizations for mm -hmm. customers who want that type of thing. Uh, we can easily take the most modules and, and put them in because Angular is cool that way. Um, but yeah, so uh, so if we want to extract like all the different fields in here, let's let's just grab um, uh, all of them, and I'm going to paste the paste the query instead of typing it out. So here we we're going to extract the things that we kind of care about. Like let's grab the computer that issued the request. The process ID, the query name, query status, query results, and then the image, uh, which is the exe in string format that uh, that resulted in in the thing. And then if we pipe that, so here's our first pipe, uh, where we're taking the results of that extraction module and we're going to pipe them into our table, which is what we call a rendering module. So this is a module that takes the data in whatever format it has received it and displays it in a, a human readable way. That's really uh, cool. We'll, you can build tables like that on the fly within your interface. Uh, yes, like that's, that. awesome. That's, 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 yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty slick. I'm, yep. je I'm so, jealous. I, I like use jQuery to build tables, and it's really ugly. Yeah, that that's sucks. you. Yes, you. Have, <laughs> <laughs> you. That is. That. Uh, there is no other way to describe it other than what Corey said. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so we see, uh, so yeah, so then we get our, our basic table of the kinds of stuff that's going on. You see a lot of, uh, and this is live, uh, so whatever is happening. And, in the and, last that's, and, and Corey, there. that's everything, right? That's everything in the data set just in a tabular format, right? Everything in the data set in a tabular format within the last, uh, I think I searched an hour. Yeah, within okay. the last hour. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess it says it right here, 344 to 444. Uh, so this is because uh, I'm Pacific time and it localizes. So, so this shows us like there's some Chrome and, and Steam and a bunch of gaming stuff. Um, but we'll get, uh, I ran some interesting things earlier, so we can, we can poke at that in just a second. Um, but then, yeah, so then, uh, you know, within, within Gravo, we can take and do some of the stuff and apply some basic stats analytics, uh, to, to play with and extract some, some interesting things. So if you'll see that the query results is, uh, not super readable, like it's not just an IP address, right? It's got some other stuff in there, or there's multiple that are comma or a semicolon delimited type of thing. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to add a regex module in here. So this is in an operator uh, module, um, which can or a processing module. So we're going to extract with regular expression. So reg regex can either filter or extract. Um, so we're going to extract using this goo because uh, nobody likes looking at your regular expressions. Uh, we're gonna extract the uh, the IP address. I used to dream uh, in regular expressions. No, you didn't. I, but I, I think <laughs> those Corey's are not called dreams. Those are called nightmares. nightmares. Yeah, nightmares. exactly. Corey's right. No one likes to look at regular <laughs> no, expressions. No, no. Wait, I like looking at regular expressions. <laughs> okay, Joff, you were the exception to that rule. Listen, I'm yeah, gonna send so... an email that's just regular expressions at you. <laughs> if Josh, if Joff is the exception to that rule, can we write a regex? Never mind. An exception, <laughs> except as exception, Joff. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's an exception handling regular expression to handle. Oh, oh God. <laughs> it's a Stay nerd. on target. <laughs> the <laughs> nerd on target. level on this show. Uh, so, so is... yeah, so we're going to extract out the root uh, domain out of here. So that's what this does. Uh, because, uh, sorry, I, I misspoke. So we've got query results that has a bunch of different IP addresses. We've got uh, the query name but if we want to do something like let's we're just curious like what root domains are showing up and what's the uh what's the count like how often are root domains getting hit 
for different stuff, uh, which could give us something like if somebody hits uh, a whole bunch of uh, you know weird subdomains on top of the uh, on top of a root domain, like that would like if it's DNS exfil or something like that, that might uh, this might be a, this is a very rudimentary way to sort of poke at that, but this is the type of thing that shows up. So we so we're going to extract the root domain, then we're going to then we're going to pipe that into a counting module so we can count by the root domain, and then we're just going to table that out uh, of of the root and the count, and we get a you know basic table of what kind of stuff is is going on. And so if I'm you know seeing this data source for the first time, which I did this week because we you know never seen this before. Obviously, I'd seen DNS before, so I had a general idea about the kind of things that we wanted to look at, but. Uh, the the data has not been seen before, so we're sort of building this out by on the fly. And so, like, this is a pretty good query. I might want to add this to a dashboard, so that uh, I can you know take a look at this once a day or once a week, uh, and get an idea about what's going on. If I wanted to, I could also create another visualization where I am going to generate a chart. Uh, we probably don't want a line chart for this though. So if we create a bar chart, uh, sort of gives us an idea. But again, this you know we don't have that much data at least in the last hour. Um, for this, uh, I could search over the last day instead uh, and get a little bit more uh, interesting visualizations for stuff. It's pretty There's responsive, a spike right yeah, there. That, yeah. Peter and I just looked at each other like that. That was really cool, yeah, no, and it that's, renders that's really. Great. I don't know how, <clears throat> how big your data set is, but that renders pretty pretty fast. Uh, yeah. It, well, that's the that's the nice part is it, it's um, the data set. Uh, if if you've got like like our largest deployment is uh, has been over 100 terabytes a day. And so, like, if you're issuing that, this is this is an aggregate search, right? I'm I'm counting by something. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you've got an index, like, there's things that you can do to speed it up. But like, if if you didn't have any indexing set up or anything, um, then yeah, you're going to be looking at every entry and counting it up. So that could potentially be, you know, uh, a big problem. But that but that worst case scenario is what we entirely built our platform to handle and optimize around as a first class citizen, so that when you are asking questions that you didn't know you needed to ask, mm -hmm. that those ags are still fast. Right. And so even on large data sets, it, uh, it can still, it, it can scream. But obviously we're not magic, we can't outrun a disk, right? So if you're trying, if you got to pull the data off a disk, then that's as fast as you can possibly be. Sure. For Store right. it in RAM, store it in RAM. M.2. Yep. Exactly, that's, you know, that's the recommendation. So it, it depends on how big your cluster is, put it in RAM. If you can keep like the last week in RAM, then it makes it super easy. And newer N.2 is pretty, I mean, it's like slower kind of RAM, but it's still pretty freaking fast. <laughs> slower kind of RAM. It's like slower RAM, but it's, I mean, 3,500 megabits a second, almost read and write. That's, yeah. that's pretty fast. No, that, I mean, if you're in RAM, then you're plenty fast. You don't mm. have, then you don't have a concern. Then, mm -hmm. it's, then it's the CPU as a limiter, but right. uh, possibly. Um, but if you're on disk, then that's where you, yeah, that's where you run. Or the bus troubles. between CPU and RAM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, what did I do here? So this is like, uh, if I'm interested oh, no. in um, like a donut <laughs> for the CLD. <laughs> did I say donut? Is that what got yes. excited? No. I saw, I saw a donut and I immediately saw <laughs> mm, donuts. Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> so if we, so if we regex out the TLD from like a query name, uh, you know, we can drop that into uh, into chart and, and right. So we're just we're just taking this domain data that came out of this new data source and manipulating it and asking questions of it to give us some visualizations that we care about, that we might be interested in uh, from a dashboard perspective, uh, but then also uh, you know from uh, from threat hunting, if we wanted to uh, to be able to dig in and and sort through this stuff in the end. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second uh, as we get into sort of a canned uh, malware analysis type thing. But uh, one of the other things that we have are, are what we call enrichment modules. So in this example, I'm going to extract the, the IP address. I'm gonna do some enrichment with geolocation using the MaxMind uh, GUIP database, uh, and then uh, throw that on a heat map. Just to get an idea of like, hey, where in the world are, are, is our DNS resolving to? And, uh, and, and that could be like a, like this is not that useful, right? These types of visualizations are cool uh, for like C-suite and to put on the wall of your sock on a big mm -hmm. monitor. Um, but this is potentially not that useful. However, uh, humans are really good at identifying patterns. And so if this is what looks normal, but then all of a sudden there's a more red area, you know, over here in this part of the globe, uh, you know, as a human, you can look at that and, and identify that. And that's even something that, 
um, you know, those visualizations and identifying patterns of visualizations, machine learning is, is doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but there's just some aspects to contextual awareness that we've got a long ways to go before that's, that's going to do anything. Uh, so at least it's, humans are really important still for, for security and, uh, and looking at stuff. Yay, humans. Mm. Yay, humans. The machines aren't going to win yet. Anyway. Um, at least not that they know of. <laughs> would they know mm. do they think in, in that way uh all right so so let's let's skip to a query uh now we're getting into uh into some like actual like let's do some threat hunting and security analytics on this stuff and see what kind of things we can work out in this um admittedly mock scenario using real ttps from stuff that we've seen uh but this is a custom uh generated thing for what we're doing so uh so one of the so, so at the top here, we're going to do our extraction the same as we have been, but I added in this additional filter uh, just to uh, uh, filter out and, and make sure that we're accelerating and grabbing our sysmon events. Um, so when you are, if you've got Gravel set up with acceleration, which I do here for large data sets, then you want to provide some additional filters in here because that can help you uh, speed up your eggs tremendously. Um, but then what I'm doing is I'm going to use this lookup module to... Uh, reference a resource that we've got in Gravwell uh, called the uh, DNS blacklist. Uh, so if I go to, I'll actually open that up real quick um, and show the, or I could just browse there instead of reloading a whole new tab. Um, the DNS blacklist is, is this resource here. This is a resource that I've got automatically populating from uh, malware domains. Um, if you're familiar with them, right, they have a free uh, DNS blacklist set up that you yeah, can download and, they, and they're incorporate actually, into your... They're pretty good, I find. In yeah. terms of blacklist go, they're, they're pretty good, and it's free. Yes. Yep. So that's the, that's the big thing. So everything I'm doing today is free, uh, which, is, which, I, which I wanted to make sure I did for the segment here so that anybody could replicate this uh, in their own system. Um, so yeah, so this grabs that, and the way that uh, actually... Uh, that's happening is through our uh, scheduled uh, search system. So we have an orchestrator and a scheduler built in here. Um, and for really uh, complicated, cool stuff that you want to do, we have this Anko scripting system. Uh, exactly what this shows isn't important, but uh, we're grabbing the uh, you know the domain updates and dropping that in there for um, for showing uh, or for populating our blacklist which then we use again in this here query to analyze and see which DNS requests from our new data source are vi in violation of this blacklist. Mm. And so we're gonna take the query name which came from the data source and we're gonna compare it against these, uh, these values that are within this DNS blacklist. This is something you just have to know but our, our query platform will help you figure that out. And then we pipe that into a table. And so here are the violators because we're operating in strict mode on our lookup. So we're going to drop any entry that doesn't match our blacklist. Um, and you can do this, the inverse thing with whitelists as well. So that's a big thing for ICS. Like you can whitelist all of your network flows and then set this up to automatically uh, monitor and email you or, or hit a webhook or, or do whatever if you see new network flows uh, that are showing up, which is pretty cool. But here we're just going to put that into a table and we're going to take a look at... Uh, at what's in there. And, um, and we've got a couple offenders here um, because I just, I, I didn't have any actual hits, which, hey, that's a good thing. Right? Mm. But I looked at the DNS blacklist. This is what that list actually looks like from malware domains. I just grabbed a couple of them and you know made some, DNA, some NS lookup requests to, uh, to pull this out. Or I guess I use Chrome, not NS lookup, since Sysmon is awesome and it tells us which, which process, process actually yeah. made that request. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So I use Chrome to try and go there. Which, uh, which in a minute we'll, we'll uh, add some data fusion because uh, the first question sort of is like, okay, it made the DNS request, but did it actually send any data? And so yeah, we'll get to that in just a second. Likely but, Chrome, Chrome probably blocked that uh, domain in its own blacklisting functions, right? Uh -oh. I wish I could say that you're right, Paul. Oh, uh, okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> it did not. It, it does not. sometimes. I definitely could go there. <laughs> it does yep. sometimes. Anyway, yes, it's true. It does. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, I don't know. That could be a potential lesson in, in uh, what's going on. Mm. 
Um, but the other thing that I did was, so we have uh, some bit of sample malware that we uh, created using some TTPs that we've observed in the real world. Um, but what's interesting is we made this we made this malware in Go uh, that does this um, does some cool stuff, which we'll see what it does in a second. Uh, so I deposited it on this desktop and ran it. Um, this desktop C2I whatever uh, ran it, and and interestingly, the first DNS request that went out was came from unknown process. So Sysmon wasn't able to identify what the process that ran or that created that DNS request was, hmm. which I think is which I think is interesting. So that may be something that we're going to poke in a little bit more and figure out you know how that works. So obviously, like like you said, Carlos had done some hmm. Sysmon evasion stuff. Um, I'm sure there's a there's methodologies in there that that we're hitting, but the yeah, other time, one did work. time to create Where some C2 uh, <clears throat> and malware in Go. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, that's exactly. awesome. Got a, I don't know, we're a total Go shop, so that's what happened. So so yeah, there's there's something with the Go runtime and how that is doing probably something with its threading, where uh, Sysmon loses track of the process. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, but the other one was was found. You see, that's some. Um, it looks like the user April clicked on payroll changes pdf.exe.exe, um, which no real user would ever click on because they wouldn't be fooled by something so silly. Of course. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to alter that query just a little bit, and I'm going to add in this regex modules because I want to know like which. Uh, which query results actually returned uh, IP addresses? And so if I run that again, that'll filter out those other, the, the ones that just ended up being a non-resolution. And then uh, now we're about to get crazy, guys. So uh, the, the cool part, <laughs> this, this is going to get real complicated. So I apologize because it's going to blow. Uh, it's going to blow through stuff. But we're going to get into some really interesting data fusion stuff that you can do. So one of the other things that I'm doing on here, let me just actually grab tag netflow. Uh, so Gravwell supports binary data natively, and one of the data sources that I'm collecting is netflow data, and so that's why we're seeing goo here because we're just showing the binary. We're not running any parsing modules on this at all. It's just what is the raw data. So we've got raw NetFlow coming into the system here. So we can see all uh, flow configurations. It's coming off of SoftFlow D, which is running on uh, my gateway router, which isn't the greatest NetFlow generator, I got to say, but it, mm. it'll suit us for these purposes here. So we're creating NetFlow data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fuse NetFlow and Sysmon together in our pipeline. So we're taking both of these different data types and we're, we're having two different source pipes and then we're dropping those into different processing pipes as we go through this. Um, and it's totally okay if this is uh, this is a little confusing because it's a mind bender thing. But we're we're going to use uh, this extraction module to pull out our our Sysmon stuff just like we've been doing, and then we're going to so Tagual Sysmon says we're going to only operate on Sysmon data within this module of the pipe. So if a pipe isn't supposed to operate on any other kind of data in the pipeline, then it'll just pass it through. Uh, and in this case, we're going to do our lookups. Uh, and we're going to grab our regular expression to extract out our query IP. And then we're going to switch over and do a little bit of NetFlow stuff. And we're going to uh, look at NetFlow and we're going to say, is the IP uh, not in private? So we're looking for NetFlow records that include IP addresses that aren't in our private space. So you could either do a lookup here or, or whatever to, um, to isolate and get, uh, get NetFlow data from those remote servers. And then I'm adding just a little bit of custom filtering for my organization here. I'm using the IP processing module and just saying, hey, does this not equal these IP addresses? And then I'm going to sort by the time. And the reason that I do that is to make sure that everything is in the right order for when I do this data fusion here. Uh, and this is sort of the brains of the data fusion. This uh, is using our eval module, which is a basic logic module. But in reality, the best thing to do for really complicated data fusion stuff is to add in a little bit of scripting because we have a scripting module that you can just drop into the pipeline. So it's Turing complete. So if you have some custom machine learning or custom stuff that you wanna do, you can create that script and drop it in the pipeline and it'll operate in the pipeline on every, mod, uh, every uh, data event that comes through. And you can enrich, you can filter, you can process, you can do uh, whatever. But we're gonna do some basic logic here and then we're gonna drop anything that doesn't have our flow host because that's what we're creating. 
and then we're going to put that into a table. So that was a wild flurry of stuff. I know it was, but here's the end result. We have NetFlow fused with data, uh, with data DNS data that came out of Sysmon. So this is NetFlow fused with Sysmon, where we've got flows between. So this is answering the question of did anybody who resolved this known malicious domain actually communicate with the remote host? That's awesome. And this is showing us all the flows that do that. So we can see that all this, as we saw, came from Chrome. So I could also include the, you know, the binary image that came from here. But right now I'm just using the, the domain host. Um, so yeah, so we can see that. So using Data Fusion, we can grab two different data sources, drop them into the pipeline together, and answer a question that we had about whether or not uh, this thing worked. And I'm assuming, and some, I'm assuming you can include port information. I resolved this host, yeah. then I communicated and I sent data on this other port, right? Right, right. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I guess I could try and uh, change this query on the fly here right now. Because um, the thing about, you know, when you're creating queries like this, you're constantly searching, re researching, running, running different things. Um, but if I NetFlow and grab out port, if I also decide to extract the port, sure, let's try it. Uh, I think that should pass all the way through. Um, yeah, so we got that too. Oh, uh, so look wow. That was impressive. Was that was impressive. Well. This is cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was impressive. I want to get the uh, fuzzy hash data in here to say, was it actually Chrome? Right, yes. And now you could say, you know what? It wasn't legitimately Chrome and it did these things. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> yeah. stuff. It opens up a lot yeah, of possibilities. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... so, um, so as the last final thing, I'm just going to pull up like a, a uh, an example dashboard that I made out of this, right? Uh, so this is very much a uh, ooh, uh, ooh, a pew pew style. Ooh, yeah, look at, look at ooh, it's a rotating globe with things, um, right? This, it's kind of cool. Pew. It's a cool visualization, but um, <laughs> but what does it tell us really? See, when I do um, that, so, it, it's just black, and then I just say it's Alderan. <laughs> You're looking for love in all different places. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah. So but but this is like you know we want to monitor the query rate. We're curious about which systems are doing the querying. What are our most common root domains? Uh, what does the map look like? Uh, um, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, everything's coming out of AWS over here. Um, what are the query results? Does that say so Pornhub.com? <laughs> oh no, that's <laughs> YouTube.com. Oh, sorry. You, YouTube or you porn? I can't tell. This is legitimate DNS data coming out of my system. So if there's anything embarrassing in here, yes. you know, it is what it is. I'm unashamed. <clears throat> That's not embarrassing. Nope. Um, and, and this uh, is live updating as we go. So putting this up on a sock list, uh, you know, the things will update. If I, if I, like, I've got a spike here that I may be interested in, in doing this. If I zoom in, um, that should reflect on any tiles that are connected to the zoomer. Um, and you could connect all of them if you wanted to. Um, but I did the query right here. To show us, you know, what uh, if I if I'm zooming in to see uh, what's so, going on. So, Corey, there. it it reminds me of Kibana, but what mm -hmm. what are what are the differences in your in your mind? Uh, the differences in our mind are yeah, it's not I mean it's not Kibana, <clears throat> but uh, cause sure because you're, you're stuck using our uh, visualization renderers mm -hmm. and, and stuff. Um, we we experimented with that early uh, to mm -hmm. try and get all our data into that type of format, but we weren't really sure. Um, I mean, in the end, it, it it didn't work out exactly. It wasn't super easy to just straight up generate our data and normalize it. So, yeah, thing. the advantage is your data normalization, right? You can take in any data and then basically graph and query it in, in any way that you want. And that's more extensible and configurable than Kibana, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, mm. it's, especially, uh, I mean, we could probably have just taken Kibana and threw it on our front end. But if you've got an Elk stack uh, set up, then yeah, that's the big difference. Uh, it's, it's it's extensible. So all the stuff that we were doing up until I've got this dashboard up, uh, we were doing on the fly without having to change anything about Grabwell. All I did was yeah. point new Sysmon events at it, and we're off and running. Gotcha. Didn't have to do anything. Yep. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we can do stuff like DNS uh, um, uh, investigative dashboards. Uh, and and in the paid version of this stuff, like all this is fairly clickable. Uh, with our kits release that's coming up pretty soon. So it's not like you got to click around here and type a bunch of stuff. Um, but I have an investigative dashboard that I set up to monitor um, or ask questions. So if I've got a suspect domain, like let's say I've got a tip 
that fired off, like whether it was malware domains or some other threat intelligence feed that I've got that says, hey, uh, Gravel.io, these guys are doing some bad stuff. You better check this out. Um, I can have it automatically uh, grab this information or go to this investigative dashboard and uh, take a view of, oh, okay, let's, let's see, you know, I can put anything on here that I want, um, but here I've got, you know, which computers actually requested this domain, uh, what was the raw records that were coming out, uh, when did they happen, and as you can see, like, um, we've got some shenanigans going on here with uh, this, uh, this um, data being sent uh, over, uh, you know, DNS. This could be, or the, at least the hypothesis is that this is a DNS exfiltration data where we're, we're encoding something uh, and sending that out to this potentially you know, evil domain. That's, that's what our, that's what our quote unquote malware does. Gotcha. Is yep. dig through yep. and see that stuff. Um, so, so yeah, but the, the, the new Sysmon stuff is super cool. Uh, if you're not using Sysmon, you should. And uh, especially now that they've added DNS uh, logging and those types of capabilities, because you can do all this really awesome stuff. DNS is probably one of the best uh, threat hunting uh, data yep. sources out of anything. So getting that in there is super cool. Um, the the um, Swift on Security Sysmon config is fantastic as well to help uh, trim that some of that stuff down and get you a, a nice baseline. Um, but it's a really great data source for you to use in your organization, whether you're a small business, whether you're a large business, um, you know, whatever you're going into. Uh, it's sort of like EDR or, or you know, endpoint stuff uh, that's really quite good uh, for for free and and does a great job. Yeah, and I, I love the tools that are available today. You know, uh, probably almost 20 years ago, I was just syslogging stuff to all one big system. Hmm using command line tools and like Perl and stuff to, mm -hmm. to, to parse and, and figure out what was bad on my network and, and you know, filter out things that were good, right? Uh, today, mm -hmm. we have so much better tools. And I also love your level of excitement, Corey. I mean, there was a few times in there where you were like so excited and I'm just, I, I love seeing that. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, man, this is what I'm passionate about. This stuff, because uh, I've, I, you know, I've done, I've done security for a while. I come from, you know, technical background. Uh, so I've been there, right? I've been trying to dig through logs with grep on a Linux command line mm -hmm. and trying to, it's like trying to do, uh, you know, a hundred thousand different files and grabbing them. That's not fun. No. Uh, and trying to figure that out. So that was, so I was excited to, you know, make the tool and, uh, and start a company around it because, uh, you know, we were feeling some, uh, some issues with where the current market was for doing stuff like the binary stuff, doing NetFlow in binary alone, instead of converting that to like JSON or some yeah. shit like that, then that makes a big difference too. Well, in terms of just throughput performance, uh, your retention that you're able to do, uh, all this awesome stuff. So yeah, and, we're excited. And Corey, about it. in closing, those who are thinking, well, I can just build an elk stack to, to, to analyze this myself. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you created this tool, right? Because of the kind of trials and tribulations of going, hey, I'm just going to build an elk stack to analyze that data. Yeah, yeah. It's it. I mean, the quote is, "It's free like a puppy." Mm -hmm. uh, right. You gotta. You know, you, there's a lot of work to do it. But I mean, that that also said, it's a little bit apples and oranges to compare elk to the way we do data. Yeah. Um, the way we do data is more like Splunk. Uh, and, and comparing Splunk to Elk is also, I mean, that's like, that's apples and oranges. It's not quite the same thing because they approach data in a very different way. Um, so uh, for some people, uh, it, you know, depending on your use case, Elk might be the right solution for mm -hmm. you, especially if you've got some people to do it internally. But, um, but yeah, we, we built it for, for the use case where you don't know what you don't know. And you've, you know, you've got, you want to be di more dynamic with what you're doing. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Corey, where, what is the, uh, hold on. There's a landing page of some securityweekly.com forward slash gravwell you can go there find more information all of the segments that Corey uh and company have done on the show are and archived when you type there it in, you have to type the v in red and the w in and, and blue <laughs> yeah otherwise yes. it doesn't work yeah. there's a, a unicode so, character or, or some such thing that <laughs> that can do that so awesome Corey, That's thank awesome. you so much for appearing on paul security weekly i encourage everyone to go to securityweekly.com forward slash gravwell uh, and find out more information, get the free product, uh, and play around with it. And uh, Corey's definitely done the five. You've done the five questions before. I did them a while yeah. ago. Yeah, I was on a couple of times. I've done the five questions. Absolutely. But. Absolutely. What's your, changed since what's then? your favorite Taylor Swift's? Never mind. <laughs> <sighs> you did it again. It was whole, out of my head, Paul. I know. Now then, look what you've done. Now it's okay. And with that, we're going to take a short break, come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned. <laughs> 